Friends, our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 90, beginning to read on verse 14. Please listen for the word of God. Fill us every morning with your faithful love so we can rejoice and celebrate our whole life long. Make us happy for the same amount of time that you afflicted us, for the same number of years that we saw only trouble. Let your acts be seen by your servants. Let your glory be seen by their children. Let the kindness of the Lord our God be over us. May the work of our hands last. May the work of our hands last. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, it kind of feels sometimes like every time we turn on the news, there is a new reason to mourn. Like there is an unending flood of negativity coming from all around us. From our TVs, our newspapers, our cell phones, And like the problems in this world are only getting worse. Lines of division becoming more entrenched. Violence everywhere you look. A climate that's rapidly deteriorating. A society that's rapidly deteriorating. A religion that sometimes feels like it too is rapidly deteriorating. And so it's very easy to look at this world with a growing sense of despair. To look at the trajectory of this nation or of this world and become overwhelmingly, debilitatingly pessimistic or fatalistic. And as you stare at these problems, these massive problems, sometimes you ask yourself, what's the point? What's the point of all this? What's the point of my life? In a world this big, with problems this vast, this ingrained, this entrenched, does my life even matter? Do my actions even matter? What can I possibly do when faced with the vast brokenness that is this world. Sometimes it can feel paralyzing, if we're being honest. Friends, I remember as a kid, I watched this family on the Today Show who had committed for a year to living a life with zero waste, or near zero waste. The family brought with them to the studio a shoebox. And inside of this shoebox, was an entire year's worth of trash for this family of four. And they had wanted to bring awareness to environmental issues, and they also wanted to be a model for others. They wanted to practice exactly what they preached. It's a lovely story. But also, when I think about that story, there's a part of me, there's a cynic in me that wants to quote the research that says just 90 companies are responsible for two-thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And the top 20 companies make up about a third of all carbon emissions. And when I think about this research, suddenly this family's shoebox, this point of pride, can feel very, very small. And so when talking about trends, on a national level or a global level, when talking about these deep-rooted problems, what good is one life? What are we to do when faced with the absolute powerlessness of our circumstances? When you feel small, what are you to do? Friends, the Nuremberg trials were a series of international prosecutions immediately following the Second World War. 
And in these trials, the criminals of Nazi Germany had to answer for all of their actions. The four allied forces, the U.S., Great Britain, the Soviet Union, France, they all agreed on a common framework for these trials because each country had their own legal system, their own prosecution. It wouldn't make sense to try these people four separate times. That just would get very messy. It would be impractical. And so they came up with this system to do it all together. Each defendant had a defense attorney. Each nation had one judge with a seat at the table. And then the trials went one by one, with each defendant being judged of war crimes, killing prisoners of war, and also crimes against humanity, such as killing uh, civilians, or more specifically, uh, Jewish civilians. The prosecution submitted plenty of evidence, all four countries, and they painted an incredibly focused picture of the whole system of atrocities that occurred in Nazi Germany, how the Nazis operated, the horrific practices that became standard, and then they showed each defendant's role in those practices. Laying out a case like that takes some time, but it was easy in that the evidence was there and it was clear. But the defense, well, they had a much harder job, as they should. And this defense became so notorious, it would later be known as the Nuremberg Defense. And even if you do not know the Nuremberg Defense, you will recognize the logic behind it. Each defendant took the stand. And none of them bothered to argue against the crimes of Nazi Germany. They didn't even argue about their own roles. The evidence was overwhelming. These crimes happened. The defendants participated in them. And so instead of arguing against the crimes themselves, through the Nuremberg defense, the defendants simply stated, we were just following orders. Just following orders. The argument went that these atrocities were going to happen whether I, the defendant, participated or not. And so I'm just a cog in the machine. Really, I'm not a criminal. I am an instrument used by the higher ups. Actually, you know what? I'm a victim. I'm a victim of their orders going all the way back up to Hitler. That's the argument. In the trials, Hitler's name was mentioned over 1,200 times. This is more than the names of the five most prominent defendants combined. Because Hitler's machine was to blame. Orders passed down from on high. And so each crime, the logic went, was a small act in a much larger machine. This is the Nuremberg defense. The International Panel of Judges heard these arguments, they considered them, and then they voted to convict. In every instance in Nuremberg, the judges voted to convict. The message was clear. Your actions matter. Yes, they were part of a larger machine. Yes, you were part of something bigger than you, something horrific. But your actions matter no matter how small. Friends, this is actually good news. Because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ invites us all to participate in something so much bigger than us and something that is not at all horrific, but rather something holy and beautiful and good. And Jesus says our actions matter. Our scriptures say the same thing. Your actions matter. You matter. No matter how small. No matter how small you feel. No matter how insignificant your actions may seem. You and your actions matter. You matter to God. You matter to this world. We have the court records to prove it. Friends, Psalm 90 tells the story of a God who creates and who also destroys. It's the story of a world with great devastation and also great 
beauty. The psalm begins with the writer describing these grand, sweeping movements, describing entire generations of people, describing large mountains, describing uh, the futility of life and how generations can be swept away like a dream, or how lives can wither and die like blades of grass. The psalm begins by painting these large truths with a very wide brush. The psalm talks about people the way we sometimes talk about ourselves. Small, fleeting, insignificant. And then near the end of the psalm, there is a turn. There's a sudden shift. There's actually two shifts The first shift comes at about verse 13. Up until this point, the psalmist, the writer of the psalm, has been resigned to this life of futility. He looks up at the cosmos and he considers human existence, his own existence, and he feels pointless and fragile and small. But in verse 13, he addresses God directly. And he says, come back to us. Lord, have compassion on us. Fill us with your love. Make us happy, Lord. In other words, he says, give our lives meaning, dignity, value. Friends, the shift goes from being and feeling small to reaching out and asking God for help. And then, once the psalmist asks God for help, there is a second shift. And in this second shift, the psalmist realizes that God has given him the tools all along. Tools to live a big and meaningful and vibrant life. And so the psalmist then ends this psalm by by repeating twice the phrase, May the work of our hands last. May the work of our hands last. Friends, if you are feeling small, first lean in to God. And then lean in to what you can control. Lean in to the work of your hands Make something of the world around you, of the space around you. Maybe not the whole world, but at least for those in your life, your friends, your families, your neighbors. If you are feeling small, remember that God has given you agency. Agency to love your community and to make a difference in it. A good deed here, a handwritten note there, a phone call to someone who may be lonely. These seemingly small acts add up. And it's not just the Christian thing to do, it's the human thing to do. To love, to care. And friends, it's easy to say as Christians that we are just following orders from on high that we are helping hands in a larger, vibrant, beautiful movement. And we are. But God has also given us agency and the ability to say yes or no to all God asks. God wants us to choose yes. God wants us to choose yes. God has given us agency to choose and to act because we matter. We matter. We are not small. Not when we're called by God. And we are especially not small when we answer that call by God. In Nazareth, there sits a small chapel where on the altar, the communion table has been replaced with a carpenter's bench. There's even a vice there for holding the wood in place. Remember, friends, Jesus Christ was a carpenter. So was his father, Joseph. 
Jesus and Joseph, they made things with their hands. They were called to be laborers. And so they were. I wonder if Jesus and Joseph ever worked together. And I wonder if as they worked together, if they ever recited the Psalms. May the work of our hands last. May the work of our hands last. A carpenter's table on the altar. It's a different view of communion, isn't it? And community. People who do small acts for one another with their hands and with their hearts. People brought together by a God so that we can in turn care for one another. Friends, this past June, I spent a week in Pittsburgh for an intensive doctorate course uh, taught by a man by the name of Gareth Higgins. Gareth is a wonderful man. I cannot recommend his books en enough. Just lovely stuff. Uh, Gareth began our class with a very simple question. Here was his question. Is the world becoming better or worse? And then he opened up the room to discussion. So friends, I am going to take a quick poll. Quick show of hands here in the room. Who here thinks the world is getting better? Anyone? All right, I see some hands. Thank you. Um, does anyone here think the world is getting worse? I know we're in a church, but it's okay. God's not going to strike you down. Okay, thank you. So our classroom, just like this church, was completely split. And our room had a lot of pastors in it, and it was still completely split. That shooting in Texas had happened just a few weeks before our class met. And so it was very difficult to make an argument that the world was getting better. Give anyone a microphone, and they will give you a litany of all the things wrong with this world. It is so easy to feel small and paralyzed by these grand, entrenched problems. The world appears to be getting worse. On the other hand, the world in general is more peaceful than it has ever been. Worldwide violence and poverty are at all-time lows. Quality of living is up. Take the time to get to know someone, and you'll find there's a lot of kindness there. Maybe more than you first expected. And so that is the argument for yes. And so again, is this world getting better or worse? My professor's answer did not sit well with me at first. I actually hated it. But I've come around a little bit on what he had to say. Here's what he said. Is the world getting better or worse? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If the world is getting worse, he says, then we have an obligation in our little pockets of the world to do what we can and to lead with love. And if the world is getting better, great. We still have an obligation in our little pockets of the world to do what we can and to lead with love. And so in one sense, of course it matters. But in terms of how we are to live or of what we are to do, either way, God has called us to lead with love. To make a difference with whatever God has given us, no matter how small. Friends, there is a freedom there. A freedom in unshackling your fears and letting go of the things you cannot control. It's basically the serenity prayer all over again. The serenity prayer goes like this, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change 
the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so no matter how big the problems are in this world, we are called to do what we can, to lead with love. Friends, this echoes the movement of the psalm. There are forces in this world so much bigger than us, problems we cannot change on our own, and yet we have agency. We have the ability to make a difference and to change lives. Change does not have to be all that grand either. That family with the shoebox full of trash, the one from the Today Show, They sparked a larger zero-waste movement. And now a growing number of people across the world are fitting their yearly supply of trash into a mason jar. And there are articles and blog posts all over the internet and in newspapers about how anyone, if they set their mind to it, could do the same. All because one family saw a daunting problem and decided to make a small difference. And all because one family decided to control what they could and to lead with love. Friends, everyone in this room is small. And everyone in this room is very, very big. You are exactly as God created you. And God doesn't make mistakes. And so when you get overwhelmed by life's big questions, take a moment to go small and ask yourselves, what small act can I do today to care for the people I'm closest to? What small act can I do today to care for my community? What small act can I do today to care for myself? Because, friends, God is present in small acts. God is present in you and also in me. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. And we thank you for asking us to lead with love. We pray today that each person here hears your call and is empowered to do small things and big things through your name. In Jesus' name we pray.